Uh, now I, I, I want to kick us off and introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Eric Green is the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at the uh, NIH. It's the largest organization in the world solely de de dedicated to genomics research. He's been at the forefront of efforts to map, sequence, and understand eukaryotic genomes, including start-to-finish involvement in the Human Genome Project. The title of Dr. Green's talk is Human Genomics, a Decade After the Human Genome Project, Opportunities and Challenges. Please welcome Dr. Eric Green. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a, certainly a pleasure to be here, and I should start off by really congratulating uh, the organizers of this conference, looking ahead at this program. They really lined up a spectacular uh, set of speakers, and I think this will be an extremely interesting and, and important uh, set of talks that you're going to hear over the next few days. I also want to congratulate the organizers for their incredible insights on how they structured the order of speakers, uh, getting the federal employees speaking today, for example, such as myself, because by tomorrow morning is a chance I wouldn't be allowed to give this talk if I had been on the program. Um, and uh, sadly, I'm not joking about that. Um, it's a, this entire conference is very much formed around the concept that genomics is becoming incredibly relevant to people. And this has not always been the case. I've been involved in genomics for 25 years or so, and when I first got involved, this was a discipline mostly relevant to biomedical researchers. Now, as the Human Genome Project became a success, and as applications of genomics widened, increasingly became relevant to healthcare professionals and thinking about ways that genomics might be relevant to healthcare. But I would say we are at a critical juncture. It's the reason we're having this conference is that I think over the, already, but certainly over the next few years and by the end of the decade, I think genomics is increasingly going to be relevant to patients and friends and relatives of patients, which means all of us. And it is really that is the, the basic premise of why this is such a relevant conference at this time. I really think my role in being the first speaker of this, this of what's going to follow a set of fantastic um, set of talks, is really to set the stage in many ways. And so I'm going to describe the landscape, which in many ways is just going to set up the other speakers. Um, just by way of background, for those who may not be completely familiar with a lot of the history, I'm just going to touch on it for context. The emphasis of my talk is going to be to describe the present framed around a strategic vision for genomics uh, that the institute that I lead uh, published a couple years ago. And then most relevant to this conference, I think, in many ways, is to take you a little bit in the future, which you'll also hear about from many of the other speakers. Um, as I said, I got involved in genomics really at the onset of the Human Genome Project. I had just graduated medical school and graduate school and had the incredible opportunity to be on the front line of this audacious adventure, if you will, that began in October 1990 and remarkably finished a short 13 years later. And in fact, this year, 2013, is very much a 10-year celebration, if you will, a decade after com the completion of the Human Genome Project. And so much has happened in 10 years in genomics. And in fact, genomics has found its way into many other disciplines, but the one that's most relevant for this conference and the one that's most relevant to me um, is, of course, those related to health, both because of the fact that, that um, much of genomics is finding its way across all of the different parts of the National Institutes of Health, where I work, and specifically, of course, the National Human Genome Research Institute, which I've been at now for 19 years and have been director for almost four, with a very laser focus on figuring out how to advance human health through genomics research. And in thinking about, especially over the last 10 years since the completion of the Human Genome Project, what very much NHGRI is interested in doing, among many other things, is to do whatever it can to support the realization of genomic medicine. And by genomic medicine, I mean an emerging medical discipline that involves using an individual's genomic information as part of their clinical care, largely synonymous with individualized medicine, personalized medicine, precision medicine. The phrase I tend to use is genomic medicine. And at our, at our institute, I think we view this very much as the central to our mission, but also a long journey, almost a marathon, if you will. That journey, that path to realize genomic medicine really began with the completion of the Human Genome Project. Genome Project was not the end of anything, it really was the beginning of everything. And the finish line, if you will, in very general terms, is realizing genomic medicine, but recognizing this is not going to happen overnight, and it's going to require many, many advances, uh, both technical and other, that are going to lead us down this path towards realizing genomic medicine. In fact, we can't even claim to know what all the steps are going to be. 
That said, we could be optimistic, having completed the goals of the Genome Project quite successfully, and we've simply got to believe we're going to realize genomic medicine, and when we do, we will have truly fulfilled the promise of why we sequenced the human genome in the first place. So how are we going to get across this path, if you will? Well, the day the Genome Project ended, our institute um, recognized that this was a big responsibility now having completed the job of why the institute was created in the first place by the U.S. Congress. And we viewed traversing this path from base pairs to bedside, or if you prefer the metaphor, from helix to health, as really central to our mission. So literally, the day the Genome Project ended, back in 2003, we published a strategic vision that outlined the next set of things that needed to be done in genomics to get us down uh, this journey, if you will. But what's truly remarkable, and I think anybody who's been involved in genomics even over the last five or six years, let alone the last 10 years or last 25 years, realizes is none of us, even the most optimistic of people in 2003, predicted things would happen as quickly as they have. And so, in fact, we found uh, just a few years after that that it was time to start thinking about a new strategic vision. And in fact, we required one and we pu indeed published one then in, in a couple of years ago. And this is the strategic vision, if you will, that we now operate by. And I just want to sort of emphasize this is one that in particular describes the sort of the set of steps that are going to be needed to actually go from information about the genome to actually operationalizing it to improve human health. And if you haven't seen the strategic plan, you can quickly go to this URL, download it, as well as gain lots of information about the strategic planning process. What we heard more than anything during the strategic planning that led to the strategic plan, if you will, was that it was time to be more sophisticated and more specific about the steps that were going to be needed to actually realize genomic medicine in describing a research agenda that was going to get us there. And at the end of the day, we found that we could organize as a framework the research activities that were going to be needed around five major domains of activity. Let me introduce you to these. The first domain is using genomics to understand the structure of genomes, how they're put together. Sounds pretty familiar. That's what we did in the Human Genome Project. But then we were required to then use genomics research to understand the biology of genomes, how it is that those string of Gs, As, Ts, and Cs choreograph all the information necessary for life. If you can have a firm understanding of how the genome works, you may be able to get a firm understanding of how changes in the genome might result in disease. And so then you want to do genomics research to understand the biology of disease. That gives you insights about disease pathophysiology. With that might come insights that allow you to use genomics research to then advance the science of medicine, starting to get into more of the medical science endeavors. But just because you have an advance in medical science doesn't mean it really changes the effectiveness of healthcare. We recognize that when you go to implement this clinically, you also have an obligation to do research to demonstrate that you're improving the effectiveness of healthcare. So these five domains really become everything that I can tell you we organize our thinking and our research programs around. So let me tell you what's gone on across these five domains in terms of research advances, especially over the last 10 years or so. But it, because this is a celebratory year, 10th anniversary, I also want to every once in a while sort of give you a highlight of what has been accomplished over very discrete time periods in genomics. Specifically, I'm going to talk about 1990 every once in a while, 2003 and 2013, because those are three critical dates. First, when the Genome Project began, what was life like? Then, when the Genome Project ended, what was life like? And then finally, this year, commemorating the 10th anniversary, how far have we come in the year 2013? So, what's been accomplished in genomics as we try to traverse from the base pairs to the bedside of patients? Well, the first thing that really needed to be done, that first step away from the Human Genome Project, was beginning to understand the function of the human genome sequence, largely research activities in these first two domains of the five domains I've described to you. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me remind you that the Genome Project produced this, or at least this is 0.0001 percent of what the Human Genome Project produced. It produced the ordered letters of the roughly three billion of them that constitute the human genomic blueprint, but it didn't provide an interpretation, if you will. That was going to require subsequent work. And in fact, 10 years ago, when the Genome Project ended, we should all recognize our tools for actually reading and understanding this string of letters was actually quite nascent at best. In fact, that is the reason why we recognize that one of the powers that we could, and tools that we had in hand to help us understand the human genome sequence was to compare it to other genome sequences that existed and have evolution help, help teach us some lessons. 
recognizing that humans are just some small little twig on this complicated evolutionary tree. That is the reason why, even before the Genome Project ended, we started sequencing other mammals, such as um, laboratory models, mice and rats, um, uh, companion animals, dogs, our closest relative chimpanzee, and so forth. But to get the real power of doing these comparative sequence analysis and comparative genomics came from sampling broadly across the phylogenetic tree of mammals, and that is why various other critters, um, by the time we were done with our initial set, about three dozen or so of those, get complete sequences of those, line up those sequences, and in fact gain a lot of information. What has been accomplished, reference relative to these three milestones? Well, 1990, we had no uh, vertebrate genome sequences. By the time the Genome Project ended, we at least had three in draft form. And by 2013, this year, well over 100 and growing um, um, every day. With that becomes powerful new computational methods that allow us to see the most highly conserved parts of the human genome and begin to catalog those sequences and figure out what they're doing functionally. What have we learned from such studies? Coupled with other experimental studies and computational studies, well, we have learned, for example, that only about 1.5 percent of the letters of the human genome sequence directly code for proteins or protein coding genes. And yet, there's an even larger amount of highly conserved sequences, upwards of about 3.5 percent or so, that we have to highlight in another color because they're conserved across virtually all mammals, but they don't directly code for proteins. They're non-coding functional sequences that are doing all sorts of other important things, such as regulating where and when and how much genes are turned on and doing other things important for chromosome function and so forth. There's actually more functional sequences in the human genome that are non-protein coding than there are protein coding. And yes, we have a complete inventory of our roughly 20,000 human genes, but we're only now getting a good handle on the, what a larger amount of the genome that's dedicated to, to function um, through other means other than directly coding for proteins. What else have we learned about the function of the human genome in the last 10 years? Well, you're going to hear about this from other speakers, but it is not just the primary sequence of the letters of our genome that encode function, but rather we now know there's a whole other language of how DNA is decorated with various chemical groups and associated with different proteins, and those epigenomic marks on our DNA, in fact, are incredibly important in health and disease. And because we've developed new technologies to read out this second genomic code, this epigenomic code, we're now in a position to now catalog not only the primary sequence and what that does, but also what these epigenomic marks on our DNA are doing functionally. Hopefully some of you have heard about large efforts such as the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements or ENCODE project that our institute leads, a large international consortium that aims to catalog functional elements across the human genome and has made major strides all the data being available freely on the internet. Increasingly, some of you will be interested in a genomic region of interest and can zoom in on that region on an appropriate browser. And like a GPS in your car, it'll be annotated with all sorts of information about where there are genes, where there are conserved elements, where there are, are regions bound by transcription factors, and so on and so forth, to give you increasingly a better and better interpretation of what every base of the human genome actually does. But like everything else, it's even more complicated than that. It's not just the linear sequence of DNA. It's not just the epigenomic marks. We're also learning that DNA is not so innocent sitting, hanging out in the nucleus. It actually has a three-dimensional structure. And in fact, its three-dimensional structure is also functionally important because different parts of our genome interact with one another within the nucleus, even though they're not adjacent on a chromosome. And that's a whole other language that we're now developing methods to help us teach what they're doing and how they're relevant in health and disease. So in terms of this first step of understanding how the human genome sequence works, I would tell you that in 10 years we've learned a tremendous amount, um, but in reality we should view it as sort of a cliff notes view, if you will, of the human genome. It's pretty superficial. I think 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, we'll be looking back and saying, wow, we continue to mine this richness of information embedded in those three billion letters, and we should be prepared to be routinely analyzing, reanalyzing, and reinterpreting our genetic blueprint, because clearly there's a lot of information there that we still need to learn. So that was the first step. What about the second step? Well, the second step is very much about the idea that we're not just interested in how a hypothetical genome works. We're interested in how each of our genomes uniquely works, as well as how all of our patients' genomes work. And what's interesting that, about the different genomes is that there are differences between them. And so we're very interested in now cataloging the variation that exists in human genomes, recognizing that all of us have a slightly different genome than anybody else in this room. And in fact, most of this has been research activities in these first two domains of activity, if you will. 
Well, recognizing that we are a string of, well, if you sort of include your entire genome, roughly six billion letters. You got three billion from mom, you got three billion from dad. And roughly, we knew and have known for many years that roughly on average about one out of a thousand of those letters are different compared to any other person in this room. And so sprinkled across our genome are single nucleotide variants, or I'll indicate here by V. We're very interested in cataloging those variants because we want to know which of those variants are biologically relevant. We want to do studies that look at those variants and figure out which ones might be not so good variants because they might lead to a susceptibility to a disease or an overt cause of a disease. We're similarly interested in variants that might end up being protective or protect you against a disease or have other, some other positive attribute. But it's not that every one of us has our own unique set of variants. Many of us share many of the variants. And so it became a problem of, of tackling and cataloging common variants that exist in different people's genomes. And that is the reason why you heard of projects like the SNP consortium, Single Nucleotide Polymorphism Consortium, or the HapMap project. And those later gave rise to the Thousand Genomes Project, which has collected samples, DNA samples, from populations across the world to get good global diversity and then is now sequencing those genomes. Actually, the name is a misnomer. It's 1,000 genomes, what it's called. We're now up to over 2,500 genomes. Typical of genomics, we're overachievers. Uh, a pilot project was published in 2010. A more recent publication came out last year. And you could look for another um, installment of 1,000 genomes publications coming up in the next uh, this year or early next year. And all this data is available in, in public databases. And it really has changed the face of genetics research. Once again, if we look across three intervals of time, when the Genome Project began, our entire knowledge of any variants that existed in our genomes amassed to a total of only about 4,000. By the time the Genome Project ended, at least, we had started to understand the, the interest of trying to generate information about variants. We were up to 3.4 million. And by April of this year, it was over 50 million and probably getting closer to 60 million. And those have provided incredible databases and abilities to now start studying those variants, figure out which ones are biologically relevant. It's also provided the ability to now understand what does a typical person's genome look like? What does a typical patient's genome look like? And there have been nice studies that have sort of told us just general, generalizations about our genomes by the numbers. As I told you, each of our genomes, about six billion nucleotides, and it turns out if you do the arithmetic, each of us has about three to five million variants. The great, 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 great majority of those variants, we've already seen them. They're in the databases we've known, we've encountered them in another person. But about 150,000 of you, so that we haven't quite seen them yet. So that would be new if we see 60 of those variants wouldn't be in either one of your parents. So across our six, billion variant, our 6 billion nucleotides, about 60 of them represent new mutations in you that just were little oopses in the replication machinery that resulted in you having a variant not present in either parent. And all of you, I think, recognize that in addition to single nucleotide variants, there's also structural variants of deletions and insertions and rearrangements, and every one of us harbor about 10 to 20,000 of those compared to any other person. We're also learning how many of those variants might be detrimental, how many of those variants might break a gene. We don't yet have good handle on how they affect the non-coding DNA, but we now know on average by 1,000 genomes data that about of your three to five million variants, about 100 of them will dis be disruptive to a gene, at least one copy of your two copies of a gene. And we also know that statistically about 20 of your genes basically have disruptive variants in both copies of both the paternal and maternal. So for the most part, each of us are walking around with about 20 of our 20,000 genes that are completely broken, which probably explains some of the diversity and probably explains some of the redundancy that's in the genome that we could tolerate 20 of our genes being broken. So this is the kind of foundation and kind of knowledge about genomic variation that allows us to move to this third important area of, of progress. And that's, of course, now starting to look at those variants and understand the genomic basis for human disease. And this squarely fits in this third research domain I introduced you to. Because really what the, all of this is about is understanding how variants play a role in determining traits and phenotypes. And of course, among those traits and phenotypes of greatest interest in, in many ways are human diseases. And of course, human diseases come in a couple of different flavors depending upon the genomic architecture of them. And you're going to hear of, of studies throughout this conference that, 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 that look at uh, the genomic basis of both of these classes of diseases, two major classes. Let me just remind you, 
On the one hand, you have rare diseases. These are simple genetically, but they're rare in the population, diseases like cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease um, and, um, and so forth. And these um, are genetically simple because they involve defects in a single gene. It's basically a mutation in a gene, and you pretty much get the disease. And while there might be other variants that influence the severity of the disease and maybe some environmental contributions, by and large, when you're looking at Huntington's disease, sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, and so forth, you're pretty much looking at mutations in a single gene as the major cause of that disease. These are also known as Mendelian disorders. These are rare in the population. They're devastating to families, but they don't represent the major healthcare burdens worldwide. Of course, the major healthcare burdens worldwide are more complex diseases or common diseases. These are diseases like Alzheimer's and hypertension and cardiovascular disease and asthma and so forth. These diseases are not caused by a single variant, but rather are often conspire with what is typically a greater contribution of the environment to conferring risks for getting the disease. We always knew that was going to be complicated, and we always hoped that Mendelian disorders would be more straightforward to untangle, provided enough information about the human genome. How has it played out over the last 10 years or even before then? Well, let me first tell you about monogenic diseases and traits. So shown here is a simple um, cumulative graph depicting uh, the number of diseases or traits for which we identify the underlying gene. Let me remind you, the Genome Project began there. And the day the Genome Project began, we knew about the genomic basis for 61 single gene disorders, 61. And then as soon as the Genome Project began, you can see that number went up considerably, and it continues to go up to the present time. And in fact, now it's approaching 5,000. Truly remarkable progress when you consider um, how, um, how, how relatively few years it's been and how many disease genes have been identified. So if you look at the universe of monogenic diseases and traits, it's actually quite impressive. We now know the genomic basis for almost 5,000. And we should celebrate that, but we should also recognize that that's only the glass half full. Because the glass half empty is that there still remains about 2,000 diseases, single gene we believe, we don't yet know the gene, and another 2,000 on top of that that we think it's a single gene disorder, we don't yet know the, disease, the, the gene, and wouldn't it be nice to fill in the rest of this pie chart? So, so memorize this pie chart because I'm going to come back to it when I take you into the future. Those were single gene disorder. What about complex disorders, more common disorders that are genetically complicated? And here I'm not going to describe in detail the strategy of genome-wide association studies. I suspect other speakers are going to go into it. The bottom line, the idea, is simply with knowledge of millions and millions of common variants in the population that had been amassed by the SNP consortium, the HapMap project, 1,000 genomes. Could we survey across those variants and now study many, many, many people with or without different complex diseases like hypertension and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and so forth, and look for statistical associations between the inheritance of a particular variant and getting the disease? And if so, it might give a clue about where in the genome might harbor causative variants that are conferring risk for getting that disease. And shown here is a typical plot where you've scanned across the genome, and you can see right there in, in red a little peak where there is statistical association with a series of markers for a particular region of the genome, giving a clue that maybe there resides a variant that confers risk for the phenotype being described. The question always was, would you get enough statistical power? Would it work? Would you be able to get enough clues? And fortunately, by 2005 came the poster child, if you will, of success. Some of the earliest data was coming out of, of, the, of the HapMap project in particular, and a successful, first successful genome-wide association study was reported, um, in this case, for age-related macular degeneration. Was that an anomaly, or would there now see successes across many other disease studies? We started tracking this at the Institute, and we, I'll just show you some graphical evidence of this. So shown here, you can see there on chromosome 1 on the far left, um, we put a little lollipop, if you will, at the region of chromosome 1 that contains the underlying variant that confers risk for age-related macular degeneration. By 2006, and you can see in 2007, we started to be able to put more lollipops on the region as more and more and more genome-wide association studies were published in nature, in science, in nature genetics, in PLOS genetics, in human molecular genetics, PNAS, genome research, and so forth. And this trend just continued throughout. And every one of these studies um, indicated new regions of the genome that seemed to have statistical relationships with phenotypes. All the phenotypes would be of great interest, all the common diseases one might imagine one would study. And that trend has continued up to the present time. 
And in fact, in 2005 was the first successful genome-wide association study, and now in the catalog that we've been keeping at, at NHGRI, that number is over 1,600 successful genome-wide association studies. And you can see we've littered the genome with these lollipops, giving us regions of interest to now interrogate in greater detail to get at the underlying variant that might be um, conferring risk for the disease. So in fact, this has been remarkable in terms of advancing um, our studies of complex diseases. It hasn't necessarily given all the answers. It hasn't given all the causative variants yet. But it has greatly reduced the search space one might need for a given study to be able to figure out where to look and to try to then uncover more about those variants than they be able to study them in a laboratory. So that's sort of the glass half full again. The truth is, though, it's also taught us something else about the genomic architecture of disease something that had been suspected but is now looking like is, is probably the case. Because we're now learning as we've discovered more and more about the genes underlying single gene defects that the great majority of those mutations are mutations in coding regions, protein coding regions of our genome, the part of the genome we understand. Those genome-wide association studies are in the majority of cases demonstrating statistical association with regions of the human genome that are mostly non-coding thinking that the variants that might be conferring risk might be in non-coding functional sequences, the part of the genome we don't understand so well. So this is a, both a challenging but also intimidating. It really does mean that, that understanding the genomic basis of complex diseases is going to not only require identifying the variants, but also understanding biologically what they do. And it should be very motivating because it's so clinically important, but at the same time, it's the part of the genome that we still have a lot more to learn about. So those are going to be some of the challenges we're going to face uh, moving forward. One of the ways we're going to face that challenge is by simply having to get it more and more statistical power of understanding which variant is really the one conferring risk. And to do that, we're going to need to get complete inventories of all variants in these associated regions and do this on thousands and thousands of patients. And thank goodness, in preparing us for that, we would need progress on this fourth um, step along the way. And I say fortunately because this, we're going to have good news to report. The fourth step really is being able to routinely sequence whole genomes. And here, as many of you are familiar, we have seen marvelous progress in the last decade. Most of that progress has been over the first three domains of research activities. I think in the future we'll see it in the more clinical domains as well. What's the origin of this progress? Well, I have to take a little credit at, at NHGRI. Because the day the Human Genome Project ended, I introduced you to the strategic plan that we published. And I was a co-author of that, along with other leaders of the Institute. And we said a lot of really audacious things, saying, now that we have the human sequence, this is what we should be doing. But one of the audacious things we said in that article was that we called for technological leaps that seemed so far off as to be almost fictional, but which, if they could be achieved, would revolutionize biomedical research and clinical practice. And the example that we put into print in the journal Nature was the example of saying the ability to sequence DNA at costs that are lowered by four to five orders of magnitude than the current cost, allowing the human genome to be sequenced for $1,000 or less. Now, why was that so audacious? It was so audacious because that was the day we had just finished sequencing the first human genome ever, and it had cost something on the order of a billion dollars. And here we were proposing technological leaps that would successively lop six zeros off that figure and deliver a genome for $1,000. In fact, this became sort of a cliche in the genomics community. It's called the $1,000 genome. It's really a battle cry, the $1,000 genome. And the idea behind this was could we put out a granting program to support very innovative ideas for sequencing DNA? And the good news is I think we could, and we did. But the other good news is that the private sector got involved in this and really helped capitalize um, innovation in the private sector that also advanced the field. And the motivation of both the public side and the private side was to basically replace the factories that sequenced that first human genome and develop some fancy nano this, micro whatever kind of fancy device that was the kind that would be used so efficiently that you could envision the ability to sequence a human genome at the cost of maybe a good clinical test like $1,000, which is really where that came to pass. And the rest, if you will, is sort of history. Um, shown here is sort of an iconic graph that many people show in their talks, and we, we, we update on a regular basis. It represents data we collect from our largest sequencing centers. And just to introduce you to this, this is basically the cost of sequencing a human genome um, over various time points going back. Notice the y-axis is logarithmic, and the white line reflects Moore's law. This is the law of the computer industry that says that compute power doubles every 24 months or so. And nobody keeps up with Moore's law except for the computer industry 
until now. Because as you can see in green is the cost of sequencing a genome at our largest sequencing centers. And the inflection point in around the year 2007 is when they started using these new technologies, these next generation sequencing technologies for sequencing a genome. And you can see the prices just plummeted. And so in fact, if you ask me how much does it cost to sequence a genome, and you'll hear from other people in their talks as well, I would tell you this is about what it costs to sequence a human genome right now. Um, under $10,000, not quite at 1,000, but we're getting incre increasingly close every month. But it's not just the money. It's also how quickly you can do it. So let me take you back to these three time intervals once again to really describe the progress. Both it's the, co the cost to generate the human genome sequence, but also the time to generate. It's been remarkable. Sequencing that first human genome in the Human Genome Project, we, were active, we spent a billion dollars, as I told you, but we were actively sequencing human DNA for about six to eight years thousands of people around the world and, re and huge numbers of machines involved. You know, if you fast forward to when the Genome Project ended in 2003, we actually asked our sequencing centers, if we asked you to now go back and sequence a second human genome, what would it cost and how long would it take? And back of the envelope, they said, oh, it probably would cost about 10 to $50 million, um, but it would still take us about three to four months to complete. Today? Well, it depends exactly who you talk to, but today I think sequencing a human genome is something on the order of four to $6,000, depending upon quality. It's south of 10,000, not quite at 1,000. As you'll hear about, you can sequence all the coding regions of a genome, a whole exome sequence for well under $1,000 these days, even commercially for under $1,000. But the remarkable thing today about being able to sequence a human genome is that you could do it in two to three days on one machine. And in fact, there's some reasons to believe that we'll probably be down to about a day with, due to some innovations by the end of this calendar, uh, this calendar year. So I don't worry about the cost of genome sequencing. I think we've sort of shifted from worrying about data generation to other worries, which I'll tell you about in a minute. I think we will coast our way to a $1,000 genome. There's incredible new technologies, some of which have been published, some of which I just know about and aren't published yet. And there's every reason to be optimistic about the cost of sequencing genomes. One of the reasons to be optimistic is just follow the literature. These new technologies, we're hearing a lot these days about nanopores, ability to, to have in these lipid bilayers, these molecules that allow s strands of DNA to be pulled through and just have an ability to detect every rung of the DNA ladder as it comes through. At least one commercial entity, I'm not endorsing them, I'm just reporting what you've all read about, has talked about commercializing instruments perhaps by the end of this calendar year. One instrument would be a desktop, benchtop type instrument, and one instrument will allegedly be a little device that plugs into the USB port of your laptop. And what's remarkable, and I've asked them this and they've confirmed, is that this little instrument will be equally effective in a PC or a Macintosh, which means <laughs> they've thought of everything. I don't worry about this stuff anymore. And whether it's this technology or other technologies, I think we will find our way to a $1,000 genome. The truth is, though, and you've learned from me already, I sort of, there's a glass half full, but there's also a glass half empty. The truth of the matter is the bottleneck that we then face by having really cheap sequencing abilities is this fifth step along the way our ability to actually analyze all of that sequence data. And this is actually a pervasive problem across all the domains. And the truth of the matter is, simply put, we're victims of our own success. We developed these powerful new technologies over the last 10 years, and those technologies spew out data far faster than any of us can assimilate that data, and it just creates a circumstance where we are no longer data poor. Um, what we are is analysis poor by comparison. This is playing out if you just follow what's flying into the public databases, such as GenBank. Back in 1990, there was a total of only 49 million bases of DNA sequence in GenBank. By 2003, that number was up to 31 terabyte bases. Today, it's like 150. That was actually back in April. I'm sure by now it's well over 150 terabyte bases. Remarkable amounts of data, and every day it grows and grows and grows, and it creates this bottleneck of how to analyze all that data. That bottleneck has multiple dimensions, and we're looking at all these at NIH. There's issues just around hardware and servers and processors and bandwidth and cloud computing and all those things. There's also issues around software, having convenient software that everybody can use, not just the genomics experts. And of course, there's lots that's being looked at and considered about workforce. How should we train the next generation of physicians and physician scientists for a world where they're going to be incredible amounts of data at the disposal, are they going to be data comfortable? And we need to be thinking about that as we train individuals. But it's not just computational challenges that we face. We also have to realize where we are right now. We are at an informational bottleneck as well, because I could literally take any of these fancy instruments for sequencing DNA. I can sequence any one of your genomes, and I can even work through all the bottlenecks, and I will get a list of the three to five million variants that exist in your genome.
because the great, 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 great majority of those variants, if I go and try to analyze them, I will just stare and have no idea what that variant means. Genomes as part of clinical research, of course we are. You're going to hear many speakers talking about the sequencing of genomes as part of clinical research, but they also will all admit that when they take that full set of variants and they go around on that patient in the morning, uh, they're sort of looking at most of those variants, not really knowing which ones are clinically relevant right there and then. This is what we need to learn about, and indeed we have many efforts to try to get us there. And you're going to hear about that from some of the other speakers. This is the reason why in various commentaries that have been written, for example, Harold Varmus wrote in 2010, but it's still from submitting their patients' full genomes for sequencing, not because the price is high, but because the data are difficult to interpret. And later on in this conference, you're going to hear from a, 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 an outstanding scientist in genomics, Elaine Martis, a good friend of mine, who wrote in a recent commentary, the $1,000 genome and the $100,000 analysis, and it's sort of funny, and then you realize it's not that funny. We've got to do something about this, and indeed, we are doing various things about this, and it's something we need to all be paying attention to. So those are the steps of progress I wanted to share with you. But of course, um, as we think about these more clinical domains, all of you have many good questions because you recognize that there's spectacular opportunities for new diagnostics and new therapeutics and new preventative measures. There's probably things I haven't even thought of that you would tell me are going to be really important for research uh, going on in these more clinical domains. And of course, these are all things that are ongoing, but these are also all things that are such a critical part of our future. So in the last 10 minutes, let me just take you into the future, at least my view of where these things are going, and also tell you what we're doing to try to enable that future. And one way to think about the future, though, I think is important to think a little bit about the past. So one of the things that we find very helpful, and we had this as part of our strategic plan we published two years ago, which was to look across these five domains and think about different time intervals, what has happened, and then predict what's going to happen. And the way we represent it is through density plots, totally hypothetical density plots that reflect accomplishments in genomics. So shown here is a density plot that depicts a blue dot every time there's a, an accomplishment. And as you can see, as the density gets greater, they pile up and change colors. So in the time interval of the Human Genome Project, where were the accomplishments? It was in the first domain, and a little bit in the second domain, but pretty much in the first domain. We elucidated the structure of genomes and understood how the human genome in particular was put together. Since the Genome Project ended until the end of the decade or so, the, you know, it was pretty much still activities in the first domain, but then increasingly understanding the genome through efforts like ENCODE, and with that came opportunities for now starting to understand disease a little bit, and maybe a few things out in the clinical domain. But the center of gravity for the five or six or seven or eight years since the end of the Genome Project was pretty much around those first two domains of activity. But what about now, until the end of the decade? What are we going to see? Well, I contend that the main activity or the dominant activities in genomics between now and the end of the decade are going to be firmly planted around the second and third domain predominantly. Continue to understand how the human genome works and getting more and more information about the genomic basis of disease. Sure, that will give us some new opportunities for understanding medical science advances and also for demonstrating effectiveness of healthcare. But again, I think the center of gravity is going to be around the, the second and third domain. But believe me, I'm optimistic. Beyond 2020, I think we will continue to see this shift over, and I firmly believe we will see massive successes in the more clinically oriented domain. But it's hard, and we have to recognize it takes many years to really demonstrate medical advances, and then in particular demonstrate that you're really improving the effectiveness of healthcare. I think in particular what we should be looking at is um, in, for the greatest successes between now and the end of the decade is around discovery related to, to human genomic diseases. And in particular, I would put the, the emphasis right there around discovery to understand the biology of disease. What are some of the things we're doing to facilitate that discovery, understanding which variants are relevant for disease? Well, I would just sort of review what I told you about earlier. We are having um, programs to take these powerful new sequencing technologies and apply them first to rare diseases. And in particular, we, about a little over, like, almost two years ago, one and a half, one and three quarters years ago, created three new centers that are just focusing on Mendelian disorders. They are going to help us, along with an international consortium of, of investigators involved in this, trying to fill in the rest of the pie chart. We think it's time to push the accelerator and really push hard to try to get at the diseases we know about. We have not yet figured out the gene. Let's figure it out by using genome sequencing. So that's one area. We also, in particular, are using our biggest genome centers, and you'll hear about Elaine Martis, for example, representing one of those centers, to really emphasize looking at complex genetic disorders, going from these lollipop regions to try to do complete interrogation of the implicated regions to figure out which variants are conferring risk to the disease. 
In particular, you're gonna, we, we, these, these centers are pursuing major studies in disorders like Alzheimer's disease, which um, the President Obama specifically requested that we pursue. I would also tell you that, look, and we're doing that in partnership with the National Institute of Aging. For example, I could tell you they're looking at autism with the National Institute of Mental Health, and we're looking at diabetes with the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Other Kidney Disorders. In each case, I'm illustrating where we are bringing our expertise and then partnering with other institutes at NIH to tackle major disease areas for which we think genomics can be very, very helpful. Another major area of discovery is one that you'll be hearing about throughout this conference, of course, that relates to cancer. And of course, I think this audience is sophisticated enough to recognize that cancer is a disease of the genome. Cells are accumulating these mutations, and before you know it, they become tumorous. And of course, opening up the genomes of those tumors and reading it out and cataloging the differences between um, some normal somatic and these tumors um, is a pow powerful way to understand um, the molecular basis of cancer. Our partnership has been quite extensive with the National Kids Cancer Institute in leading the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA. Here, of course, is one um, project in the United States, but is similarly being met by many projects around the world to interrogate all different types of cancer and then literally analyzing hundreds and hundreds of specimens to try to amass very large data sets um, um, of, of various flavors, including genomic sequence data, but also RNA sequence data and, and epigenomic data to try to really have a full court press, if you will, on, um, on cancer using genomic approaches. So whether it's rare diseases or common diseases or cancer, I think what you're going to see between now and the end of the decade is remarkable advances in discovery, getting at which variants are the ones relevant for those diseases. But what this conference is as much about as understanding the genomic basis of disease is really applying this to change clinical practice. So what's really happening in genomic medicine and the applications? What do I see as some of the hot areas? And here you're going to hear about this through many other speakers. I'll just tell you some of the ones that in particular we're looking at, and you're going to hear an emphasis on those as the conference goes on. The first one I would name the hottest areas to look at over the next few years is, is going to be in cancer, what I just introduced you to. No question that we're already seeing this operationalized at places here at Mayo and places around the world where clearly cancer, has become, cancer is a disorder where genomics has become, become mainstream as part of diagnostics and as part of uh, treatment decisions. A second area, which I almost feel funny talking about, was you come to the Mayo, you always think about pharmacogenomics as the outstanding leadership. People like Dick Washenbaum and others have for many years been talking about the amazing uh, um, opportunities in pharmacogenomics. Clearly, this is, and you're going to hear about this from other speakers, and we are partner in partnering um, with NI, uh, National Institute of General Medical Sciences to accelerate advances in pharmacogenomics, because we think now is a great opportunity. And you'll be hearing more about that. This is already here and now for some um, medications, and that list is going to grow unquestionably between now and the end of the decade. No question that for ultra-rare genetic disorders, sequencing a genome of a patient who has undergone significant medical inquiry and failing to yield a diagnosis just makes sense. And story after story after story um, is clearly indicating that this is now going to become part of regular diagnostics for individuals afflicted with ultra-rare genetic diseases. And I will just tell you, the speaker that's going to follow me, Howard Jake, will tell you compelling stories where, where he, as an example, has reduced this to practice um, and, and, and has had some really remarkable successes that I'll let him tell you about. A fourth area, Unquestionably, we're going to see major changes both in prenatal and newborn um, sequencing opportunities to do genomic analysis. Increasingly, we're reading in the literature of opportunities to sequence the DNA of um, unborn babies just by accessing the DNA in maternal serum and having powerful methods to actually read out the complete sequence of an unborn baby in this way. And uh, I can tell you that there are companies set up that are trying to operationalize that and perhaps replacing amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling and having a more non-invasive way of accessing um, uh, fetal DNA. Similarly, we just announced two weeks ago a major research endeavor with the National Institute of Child Health and Development to study, not yet to deploy, but to study opportunities for doing genome sequencing of newborn. What can we learn? What are the issues? How would we operationalize that to maybe one day replace the genetic screening that goes on in all states in the United States and maybe having more powerful approaches, but also being cognizant of some of the ethical and legal and social issues that, and logistical issues that need to be dealt with? So we are jointly working with our colleagues at the National Institute of Child Health and Development to study this for the next few years to see if we can help imagine what that future is going to look like. 
We recognize that there is a huge amount of data that's coming down the pipe and having practicing healthcare professionals know which of that data is clinically relevant is something we need to help them with. And so, in fact, just last week, we announced a major new initiative, and you're going to hear a later speaker uh, talk as one of the, the grantees who's involved in this, who we are trying to start to now develop a clinical genomics information system, recognizing that's a key part of this for practicing healthcare professionals. And finally, we have various programs, and others have various programs as well. I just sort of describe as test drive programs. Genomic medicine is not hypothetical anymore. It really is here. People are doing this, and we need to study it. We need to get best practices, and we need to figure out how we can facilitate expanding this tremendously. And so we're trying to seed that through a number of different initiatives, which really are pilot projects, or in many ways are demonstration projects, or they're, or they're projects to help disseminate knowledge of how to operationalize genomics for clinical applications. And so I think these are the six of, of and there's other areas as well, but six in particular that you'll be hearing about at this conference, and you'll be seeing play out um, um, in, in, in the clinical realm um, over the next few years. So in closing, let me just tell you that, you know, my view of this, I think, which very much speaks to the purpose of this conference, is that, you know, you know once upon a time when the Genome Project began, you know, there was, there was an, a, a vague idea that the reason to sequence the human genome was that one day we might be able to change how we practice medicine. I would say when the Genome Project ended, you know, maybe we had a little bit better idea of what was going to be needed, but it was still pretty blurry. I'd say a couple of years ago when we published our new strategic vision, I think we started to gain clarity on what was going to be required to actually operationalizing genomics for clinical practice. And I really think we've set up a circumstance that by the end of the decade, this is going to be clear, that we're going to bring clarity, it's going to come much more to focus. Doesn't mean that by 2020 we've changed the face of medicine or that we have all the answers. Absolutely not. I'm sure we'll only have a minority of the answers. We'll have many decades of additional work ahead. But I think it'll be much clearer because we'll have many examples where this is now standard of practice. And as a result, we'll be able to build on that foundation for pursuing other areas of clinical medicine. But none of this is easy, and so let me just leave you with a quote. Um, and recognizing that I think one of the things I am particularly proud of, uh, sort of um, being heavily involved in the genomics community and uh, now being the director of NHGRI, is I'm surrounded by a community of people who just uh, are not phased by challenges. They just love challenges, and they just embrace them. Um, and so the quote I like is Winston Churchill's quote, who said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity. That is not the genomics community. If we were pessimists, we would have never believed we could do the Human Genome Project. We would never believe we could develop technologies to sequence a human genome for $1,000. We just sort of take on these audacious challenges. So I think the genomics community are optimists. And as he said, an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. And I think that's what you have before us. You have these remarkable challenges, and they're going to be difficult. But boy, are they spectacularly compelling opportunities. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. We're going to have some uh, chairs here so oh, we can chairs. sit and be, be comfortable while we, while, we, uh, while we have a conversation. Uh, order in a cup of coffee or something okay. here, too. Uh, well, thanks for that, that stimulating talk and getting our conference off uh, on, on a great foot. We're going to have some questions coming up here, but, but um, I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, in in your, your talk, you talked about the cost of this coming down, now a $1,000 genome, $100,000 analysis. In 2013, who should get their genome sequenced? Um, well, so here, here's what I would, uh, first thing I would say is I think it absolutely should be an individual's choice. Um, no question. Um, but if you ask me um, if, if it was my child that had an ultra-rare disorder and had gone through a, a diagnostic odyssey, I would have a very low threshold. I could just speak as a parent. No question. So there for a diagnostic dilemma? No question. Yes. If um, I would almost, for, for many types of cancer, if I had any family member with cancer and I saw for that, that there was enough research in the area that, of that particular kind of cancer that it might be informative to sequence the cancer genome. No question. So I think these, in these clinical circumstances, I think no question. I think when it starts to be in some other areas where people are just curious or they think maybe they'll learn, then it becomes, you know, we're sort of in an awkward phase where we can, but doesn't mean we fully understand. And right. I think lots of people are, 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 are making those choices. And, and by the way, they're making those choices whether it's about complete end-to-end -end sequencing or as uh, I'm sure many people are familiar with, we could also just learn about maybe a couple million places in your genome and know what that variant, whether you have a variant or not, 
that, and that is sort of a, a, an opportunity to sort of at least get some information that some people find useful and some people don't. So is the goal to bring the cost of genome sequencing down to the part, point where it could be part of one's, not annual exam, but, but part of everyone's medical record, part of everyone's uh, health portfolio? I think without question, we, one can envision that. I think we, we need to demonstrate that's a desirable thing to do, and we also need to think about um, um, what's the best time to do. It's one of the reasons why we're launching this program to, to ask the question about genome sequencing of newborns. One could imagine, I'm not advocating, but one could imagine a future where a newborn's genome is sequenced, that information is put in their electronic health record, and as part of their regular checkups, even if it's annual checkup, that, that genome gets reinterpreted, since we'll be learning more information, and any information, new interpretations of the sequence is added to the medical record. But we've got to be careful before we go. There are lots of questions. What should you know? What should you know? Who has access? What do you tell that child, and at what age, and so, so on well, and so we'll forth. We'll be getting, yeah. there'll be great talks on the ethics and, and of those really complex issues. So uh, a, a question from, uh, from the audience. What research is being done in computer science to apply, enable, enhance the data analysis? You know, as you were talking, the, the sequencing is getting really cheap, but the analysis is very expensive. What's so, going on so, there, so there's lots being done. I would also point out that everything I describe about genomics and how analysis has become the bottleneck is just emblematic of what's going on across biomedical research. G genomics is, again, a poster child. We're sort of led. It's sort of clear. That's a bottleneck. But there's as much um, data overwhelmed. We're, we're overwhelmed with, with imaging data because of imaging advances. We're going to be overwhelmed with electronic health record data. We're getting more and more data about phenotyping individuals. And all of this data not only needs to be analyzed, it needs to be integrated and cross-referenced. So it's genomic data, but it's lots of other data. NIH, as one example, recognizes this. We recently launched a new program called Big Data to Knowledge, or BD2K. This is a program that is trying to accelerate our ability to convert big data into biological knowledge. We're doing this even though budgets are tight and it's hard to launch new initiatives these days, and yet it's a, so overwhelmingly important to do it. The NIH leadership found that it absolutely was required. Lots of things are being done. It's everything from developing better software tools to figuring out better ways to share data to training the next generation, which I touched on, and then amassing experts who are going to bring cr new ideas. The exciting thing that's going on is that I can tell you, because I was there, that even in the middle of the Genome Project, you would go and talk to an expert computer scientist at MIT or at Harvard or Stanford, and you say, come work on genomics, and they would look at the amount of data, and they would say, that's not big data. If I want to work on big data, I'll go work on climatologists or an astronomer or a particle physicist. Now, we're getting lots of, of very talented computer scientists interested in biomedical research because we finally are at the grown-ups table with respect to big data. You know, I, I was moderating a conference last week on, on innovation. And one of the things uh, innovators and investors were saying is that without the regulatory system keeping up with the research, it's very hard for, for companies and others to move, to move forward on the innovation. What's, what's happening on the regulatory side? Is FDA keeping up with what you all are generating in terms of information? Yeah, so I think there's a speaker later in this conference coming from FDA, so I mean, I think there'll be a whole talk on that. The, the short answer is I think they're trying, and I think it's very challenging, and there's, and there's many different components of this, and, and it's so fast moving, and so, I, I, and, and we're talking to them a lot, and there's, a, there's really quite a lot of interaction, but, it's, but you're absolutely right. It's one of a whole list of things you can also toss on, I'm sure it's something that th th this place thinks about a lot, is, is how, do we, what's the, how do we educate not only the next generation of healthcare professionals, what about the ones that are at mid-career? This, this, this genomics movement is moving much faster um, than any of them were, or were prepared for. I can think about what I was taught in medical school, and we were, the word of genomics didn't exist. And my classmates still have 20, 30 more years of medical practice ahead of them. Well, there'll be a, a breakout session on, on education coming up later. A uh, question that we, we just had there, um, you, you were talking about being able to do a, a, a mini sequencing of the coding regions of, of yeah. the genome. What, yeah, what's yeah. going on, on on sequencing of those 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 non-coding regions? So, well, yeah, introns. Well, it was introns. It's also intergenic regions. Mm -hmm. um, so you get all that. If you do whole genome sequencing, you get it all. Um, but you're left with a challenge of how to interpret the data. And so it's both more expensive and it's data we don't even know how to analyze. So a lot of, and I'm sure you'll hear talks at this conference, a lot of studies, at least for now, are doing whole exome sequencing because it's, it's cheaper and at least we know how to interpret it. 
but, but, but that's, only gonna, that, that's sort of the low-hanging fruit, and everybody acknowledges it. So it's what we can do now. It's the low-hanging fruit. Eventually, we're going to want to be able to be in a position to always do whole genome sequencing and be able to interpret all the variants, not just those that sit in coding regions. Um, I spent most of my career at the CDC and, uh, with a focus on, on primary prevention. Um, how do you see genomics, uh, you know, the, the highest tech of, of medicine, tying into to primary prevention? You know, we, pharmacogenetics in terms of secondary prevention and, and tailoring treatment. Um, what are your thoughts on primary prevention? Heart disease, yeah. cancer. So th those are some of the big challenges of really understanding, I mean, you know, how will, I mean, and this gets into how the, the uh, we're both physicians, are sort of the ookiness of healthcare delivery. It gets really complicated. You tell people not to smoke, they still may smoke. The question is, when we have m more definitive information about somebody's susceptibility for getting hypertension or cardiovascular disease, will it change their behaviors? Will it make it more real? Yeah. Um, and we have studies that Do are... Do we know the answer to that We yet? don't yet know this. We don't yet fully know it. No, but I will tell you it, 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 is the fact that we recognize that this is as it's our responsibility to also study that in parallel. And genomics has always done that. We've always had this ethical, legal, social, and I would throw in behavioral component, research components in what we do, and that we continue to fund that work because that's a, an important part about whether demonstrating that fifth domain, whether we truly will improve the effectiveness of healthcare, is going to have to, it has to work out there in the real delivery systems. You know, and when I'm sitting with, a, with, with parents who are both obese, and they have their, their child, and I, they both have diabetes, and I talk to them about family history and, and, right. and diabetes, uh, and see that they're still giving their, their children several sodas a day. Right. Uh, it's not motivating. Um, will genomic data offer more? It's a, it's a great question, and if you notice, I'm, I'm being cautious. I didn't list it as one. I didn't say we're gonna change the face yeah. of how we're gonna take care of common diseases and my low-hanging fruit for genomic medicine because it's, it's both complicated and, and we don't know how crystal clear it's gonna be. And these, these are the challenges. But, but what we hopefully will learn about is more about the pathophysiology of complex diseases and whether that leads to maybe new treatment paradigms as opposed to behavioral changes. You know, we, yeah. we wanna pursue both avenues. All right, so uh, next question from all of you. The standard of care seems to seriously lag progress in genomic medicine. Do you think the current system for changing medical practice is adequate or needs to be accelerated? Yeah, it's, 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 it's um, sort of very funny when you sort of are in a hot area of science and then you sort of say it touches medicine. Every, I, I sort of feel like genomics is responsible for making sure Obamacare works, too. It's a huge responsibility. <laughs> that was my next question. Yeah, right. I figured you were going to ask that, too. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's actually very funny. I, I sometimes show a slide. I, I don't have a good answer to that. That's yeah. the right. Yeah. And I sometimes show a slide is that, you know, most of people in genomics, like myself, we're, we're really just a bunch, even though I went to medical school, really a bunch, bunch of basic scientists. You know, that's where we spent most of our career, just learning how to map, sequence, understand DNA. And now we're, we're, we're trying to facilitate getting this into medical practice. And it's new for the community. And so this whole field of implementation science, which is a phrase you hear more and more about, is something we're trying to learn. Um, and we feel responsible. Now, we're not the experts, so we're mostly collaborating. But I think that's a great question. And it's one that we need people who are much more experienced at previous advances and how they've been operationalized and implemented in healthcare delivery, helping to guide us, advise us, and help us design research studies that will help facilitate it. Because we can't think we're going to wave a magic wand and fix medicine. Medicine is pretty complicated. You know, go back a decade when, when the Human Genome Project was, was being launched. Um, you know, decade to, it ended. And when it ended. ended, I'm sorry, yeah, when, when, ended. It, when, it, when it ended. Um, at that point, uh, when you were thinking a decade forward, because I loved your slide with, with looking forward and the, the, the scattergram. Um, how right were predictions a decade ago of where we would be in 2013? So they were inaccurate in that we, 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 didn't think, we didn't think it would happen as quick. We weren't optimistic enough. Seriously. Well, I mean, I mean especially, well, it depends on the area in particular. Around technology development in particular, we underestimated. Yeah. We never thought the technologies would happen as quickly as they did. I think in many of the other areas, you know, where where we might have gotten, you know, where we might have gotten overly optimistic are sort of the the trailing claims that we're going to revolutionize medicine. You know, we sort of in the, when the champagne was going off because the Genome Project ended, various people were going, "Oh, we're going to revolutionize medicine. We're going to change the face of medicine." You know, that didn't happen in the first 10 years. Right. Probably won't happen in the first 30 years. I mean, that's that's. But but if you look at some of the specific the reason why, and it was very real to us, the reason why we didn't even wait 10 years to publish a new strategic vision is by about, you know, we published it in 2003, 
really by about 2008, 2009, it was dusty and gray, and we thought it was going to sort of last a decade, and it really was because we were doing so, such an effective job. You know, one of, one of the areas where there's, there's a, a, a lot of, of hope being put forward is around cancer genomics, and that we'll no longer be talking about the organ of cancer, we'll be talking about the genome of the cancer. Um, how real is, is that promise, that the genomics of cancer will, will drive therapy and, and, and new treatments? So you're going to hear from other people during this conference, I mean, it, I think there's no question that is the case for some types of cancer. I'm, I'm cautious to give overgeneralization because, you know, as you well know, there's many, many different types of cancer and we shouldn't necessarily think that, that we're going to be able to sort of crack the nut on every different type. But I, I, I think we're already seeing this as game changing for some types of cancer and I think we will just continue to see this progress across more and more different types of cancer. But that doesn't mean it's going to be easy in every case. You know, one of the areas that's, that's uh, uh, available to the consumer right now is home genomic testing. Direct to consumer. Direct yeah. to consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's, this, is, this is something that's very trendy, yep. uh, telling you what sport your child might, might be yep. successful in to... What pharma, what, 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 what uh, cosmetic to use. Exa yeah. Exactly. Right. What, what to eat. E exactly. Right. Um, What's your take on that whole line, that, that whole approach to, to genomics? Is it, is it helping people understand the, the field or is it a, a little oh, you, dangerous? You hit the nail on the head. I, I mean, I always talk about it's a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it gets people talking. On the one hand, it gets people thinking and asking and, and being inquisitive. And I think to that extent, it's great um, because, uh, and, and especially I think uh, that kind of dialogue is so important. On the other hand, as, as a physician, I get nervous because, and as a scientist, I get nervous because I don't want them to overreach. I don't want them to, to make it sort of like they think the body of evidence behind some clue is definitive because it's far from definitive. And I certainly think this idea of, you know, what's the best sport, what's the best food, what's the best cosmetic, that's a little too genetic deterministic for me and I don't believe it. And I, I worry, therefore, when people are disappointed because it's wrong, they'll then throw out the other, the, the great potential of genomics they'll think was, was sort of swept in with that. So I'm always, that always worries me as well. What, you know, the, the, you talked about clinicians and their ability to, to, to understand this information when they're working with, with their patients. What do you think needs to, I, I, and I deal with the issues of medical and scientific literacy every day, yeah. what do you think needs to, to change across society for, for people to really be able to take in this information, understand risk, and, and use it for health? So, so I think we need to cover the waterfront on education efforts. Uh, we're doing small things like we just created a, a major exhibition with the Smithsonian. Um, uh, the National Museum of Natural History it has a major exhibition on genomics we did in partnership with them. It'll travel North America for the next four to five years after it leaves Washington, D.C. That's just for the general public. I think about it, and we want to do lots of other things that we're doing to educate, to excite people about genomics at various levels of education. We also need to recognize it can't just be doctors. Um, and so we at NHGRI are involved in working with nurses and pharmacists and physicians assistants and so forth. Every member of the healthcare community needs to be part of this, um, especially because many of them spend far more time with patients than, than physicians do. And we need to sort of raise everybody's uh, uh, um, sophistication level so they can be communicating with patients. Uh, please join me in, in thanking Dr. Green for getting us off to a, a great start today.